Bible is open in John 4. <clears throat> Have you heard the, um, the saying, ignorance is bliss? You probably have. And if you haven't, it's the idea that it's sometimes good to not know certain facts, to be unaware of them. Uh, and as a result, uh, you'll be perfectly happy and content. A lack of knowledge in certain areas of life will actually give you satisfaction uh, and a real blessing. Well, this saying actually it comes from a poem by a guy called Thomas Gray. And the last stanza reads like this To each his sufferings, all are men, condemned alike to grow. The tender for another's pain, the unfeeling for his own. Yet, ah, why should they know their fate, since sorrow never comes too late, and happiness too swiftly flies? Thought would destroy their paradise. No more. Where ignorance is bliss, it is folly to be wise. In other words, it's better to stay in the matrix or a fictional world, as it were, that masks reality than to know the truth. Well, Jesus, in this chapter, he challenges this and he shatters the illusion that we can find ultimate sat satisfaction in anything and in any place other than knowing him. To know him is to be wise, and that is not folly at all. And he does this by addressing the most unlikely person, an outcast in our own society, a Samaritan. Uh, the Samaritans were shunned by the Jews. Uh, a woman who was not to be addressed by Jewish men, or any men really, in public, um, let alone a rabbi of the Lord Jesus Christ, a religious teacher. And Jesus, he comes uh, in the heat of the day here and he sits by Jacob's well and he says to this woman, give me a drink. And she is utterly stunned by this. She's taken back. Who is this Jew who dares break custom and social norms to address me, a Samaritan, and a woman, and a woman who comes in the heat of the day? I'll keep saying that, but I'll come to that later. Keep that in mind. And she queries this with Jesus, who then responds with this very strange statement. If you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. What a strange encounter this is. A woman coming at the heat of the, in the heat of the day, a man, a Jew sitting at the well, no one else around, and he starts telling her that he would give her living water. Very strange encounter, and yet Jesus says there is something vital you must know. In fact, it's not a something, it's a someone. Now she had no idea who this person was who was standing before her. And yet the person who was standing before her was the living God incarnate. It was the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God in human flesh, the one that John the Baptist said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. It is the one the Apostle John called the Word. The Word who was with God and the light, the true light. It was the one who Nathaniel called the Son of God and the King of Israel. And he sits and he says to this woman, you're in ignorance. You're ignorant and it's not bliss. But if you knew me, you would be satisfied for eternity. Now, unlike Thomas Gray's poem, he's saying you will no longer be condemned to run. The central issue in this passage, in this encounter with the woman is who is Jesus. This is always the central issue. What would happen if that ignorance was removed? The ignorance of the Lord Jesus Christ, what would happen if that was removed? We're going to see. That is the focus of this sermon, that we must know the Lord Jesus Christ and we must know him intimately. Now, in one sense, this woman is very ordinary. Because we are all like this woman before the Lord Jesus Christ, before the living God. 
all of us. And we're going to see the progression of salvation uh, in this passage and the light of the Lord Jesus Christ dawn in this woman's heart. And we're going to look firstly at her ignorance and her felt need. And then we're going to move on to her undoing and her real need. And then thirdly, the consequence, the result of this new knowledge that she has of the Lord Jesus Christ. So firstly, we're going to look at verses 10 to 15. Uh, her ignorance and her felt need. She shows that she has no idea who Jesus is, who she is talking to. And this man offers her living water. He says, you're in ignorance of the gift of God. And therefore, you're in ignorance of who I am. They go hand in hand with the same thing. And this is symptomatic of the human race. We are all in ignorance until, we, and until the Lord Jesus Christ speaks directly to us. You may have gone to school and, and sat in a, a, what do they call it, a assembly. When I was younger, we used to have Bible stories and so forth. You may have heard about the Lord Jesus Christ. You may have had some knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. But until he speaks to you, until he speaks to your heart, you are in ignorance of him. Now, this woman thinks Jesus is talking about physical water. Now, why would she not? She's just come all this way to the well to get physical water. Why would she think anything? She's made this trip in the midday sun. Uh, again, I said it, it's very unusual. No one ventured to collect water in the heat of the sun. It was too burdensome. It was too difficult. It was too hot. There's something very strange here, something unusual. And she completely misses what Jesus says about if you knew. She, she forgets that. She skips over that. And she latches on to the physical her felt need. She's come all this way for water. She's going to take it all the way back to the village and store it. And she's going to come back again the next day. She latches on to her physical need. But she's also sceptical. This man has no bucket to draw with. Who does he think he is? Is he greater than our father Jacob, who dug the well? In other words, she's saying, who are you? Who do you think you are? Do you think you can provide for me? Well, you can't because you have nothing to provide me. You have no bucket to draw with. Now, is that you this evening? Do you think like that? Do you question Jesus' ability and willingness to provide for you? Christians fall into this all the time. You don't have to be an unbeliever to think like this. Jesus is more than willing to provide for us, and he is able. But Jesus says... This water is ordinary, and you will need it again and again and again and again until you die, because that is necessary for this life, for what I offer, what I am offering you. If you drink it, it will last forever. It has no end. What I offer you is indeed eternal life, and by the very definition of eternal life, there is no end. Do not miss this. Judge for yourself if I am greater than Jacob. This is the implication of that. But this woman, she misses it again. She stays with the physical. She stays with her felt me. She misses Jesus. What does she say? Give me this water that I may not thirst anymore. That I may not have to walk here every single day in the heat of the sun. I don't want this burden. That I may have to carry this burden uh, and this full bucket all the time. Give me this water. She's still thinking about her felt need. She wants something that's on offer. She wants something that Jesus is giving, or she thinks. But she doesn't quite understand what Jesus is actually giving. She doesn't yet understand. And we all do this. We all latch on to the felt need. We want what Jesus gives, but we don't want him, do we? We don't want the Lord Jesus Christ. We want what he gives. We want the gifts, not the giver. 
Now the Jews, they sought for a sign. They sought for the miracles, the physical phenomena. But they did not want the Lord Jesus Christ. She had missed the point. Have you missed the point? If you knew, Jesus said, then the knowing comes first. We must know the Lord Jesus Christ. The fundamental truth is that we must know him. It must be grappled with. We must grapple with who is Jesus. And many of us have. It must be grappled with. We can get so caught up in our felt need. But Jesus knows our need. He knows our need. But we can get so caught up in the felt need of our lives that we miss him. We don't want to miss him. To seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And the second part, all the other things will be added to you. But what is the first part? Seek first the living God. Seek first Jesus Christ. Jesus. He has compassion, real compassion for this woman and her felt need. He doesn't ignore it. He doesn't uh, forget it or say, oh, skip that, I want to get to something else. He engages with her. He goes straight with her. He takes her where she is and he goes along with her. He's drawing alongside her and he draws comparison of what the world has to offer the physical water the well by what he is offering eternal life that will quench her spiritual thirst he comes alongside her he takes her where she is and he has compassion on her he says i understand i know i understand why does he know why does he understand? He doesn't go straight to the central issue of her rebellion. He'll get there. Many of us, we want to just skip the uh, skip the, uh, the, 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 the needs of people. And we want to go straight to their rebellion and say, forget that, you're a sinner. But Jesus doesn't do that. He meets her where she is. He has compassion on her. He comes alongside her. Because he has been where we are. We do not have a high priest who cannot sympathise with our weakness, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. He knows us. He understands us. He's been where we are. He comes alongside us. He meets us where we are. And he's done this, and he's doing this in this passage with this woman. He's come alongside her, and he's taking her with him in one sense. But he doesn't go straight to the issue yet. There are so many people around us who are frustrated with what the world has to offer uh, and they discover the emptiness of that. The, uh, there's no amount of trying that can satisfy their deepest need. Is that person you? Are you empty? Are you frustrated? Have you uh, tried to satisfy your deepest needs and been left empty? Have you got to the point where you think, what is the point? Why do I exist? What's the point of this life? And you're going to come up against that in Toaster. On the streets, the people that come into the, to the church. Many people today are unchurched. They don't know the gospel. They don't know what, the, what we know. They're trying everything to be satisfied in this life, and they cannot. And we will meet them. Maybe you are that person. And Jesus said, this water I give will become in you a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. You will never be satisfied because there will always be something else. It will go. The... the, the, the uh, Whatever you're looking for, whatever you get, it will flee. It's fleeting. It's gone. It's gone. It's gone. I need something else. I need something else. I need something else. But Jesus says it's a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. This is more than full. This is overflowing. And it's continuously overflowing. That is real satisfaction. Because it's continuous. There's no room for anything else. And it doesn't run out. 
And we're told in Jeremiah, we read earlier, that God is the fountain of living water. This is what Jesus says, the fountain of living water. But this woman is a Samaritan woman. They only believed in the five books of Moses, the Pentateuch. They didn't have the rest of the scriptures. They had rejected them. So she was ignorant of this reference. She was ignorant of the truth of God. She was ignorant of who God was. The very gift of God was Jesus himself. And God had given his only begotten son. that Whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. You'll read that in the previous chapter. This is the eternal son of God who comes and he dwells in a person by the power of the Holy Spirit. And he gives them new life. He gives them spiritual life. This is what the gift is. This is what the Lord Jesus Christ comes to do. He gives you eternal life. And he, 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 he comes in us by the Holy Spirit. He lives in us. He gives us what we need. And so does the Father. The Father and the Son, they come and make their dwelling in us. This is what Jesus is offering. So what is Jesus saying? He's saying, I am the water. I am the fountain of water. I will make my dwelling in you and you will be satisfied. What you are looking for, you will not find unless you find me. You will know me. You will know me. And that means you will have eternal life. That is what I'm offering. That is what I give you myself. Do not miss this. But how do we know? How do we receive this water? He says, I will give you a drink. I will give you water. But how do we receive it? Well, like ordinary water, you have to drink something. You have to drink it. Ordinary water won't do anything unless you drink it. You need to drink it. You need to quench your thirst. You need to hydrate yourself. You need to uh, get the nutrients inside you. You need the water to sustain you. You drink throughout the day. You drink coffee, tea. Well, the coffee won't do anything but tea. <laughs> uh, you drink. You get it inside you. And you do it throughout the day. You have to drink. You have to keep drinking. Now, in this context, to drink simply means to believe. That's how you receive it. You believe. When we drink, we receive something into us. The water we receive into our bodies for life and sustenance. But when we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, we receive something into us. We receive him into us for life spiritual life, eternal life, and sustenance, spiritual sustenance. To drink is to believe, that's what it means. Have you drank of the life-giving stream of the Lord Jesus Christ? Have you drank of the wells of salvation? Not Jacob's well. Have you drank of the wells of salvation? Have you believed in the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, at this point, the woman still does not get it. The woman of Samaria still does not yet understand what the Lord Jesus Christ is saying. And therefore, she doesn't know the Lord Jesus Christ yet. She needed to know something. She needed to know the Lord Jesus Christ was the Messiah. She needed a deeper work of God for the scales to drop. She needed to have her eyes open. Because ignorance of Jesus will keep anyone out of heaven. The vital thing is we must know Jesus intimately. This, this woman does not yet know Jesus intimately. And this brings us to our second point. Her undoing and her real need. So Jesus has met her where she is. He didn't cast her aside. He didn't say, right... Enough of this, I need to get to the real thing. He takes her where she is. He engages with her. And now he's brought her along. And now, 
is going to expose her real need. She needed to know that she needed to be converted and she needed to be cleansed from her sin. She didn't have the truth. She was a Samaritan. She didn't know the Lord. She needed spiritual life, a vitality that she did not yet possess. It was lacking. Ask yourself a question. Do you have this life in you? Do you have spiritual life? Real life? Eternal life? She had gone from one man to another and so on and on and on and on. Never finding real satisfaction. She was stale and she was empty. Like so many people today. It's not about the particular sin. The point is, is that she was looking for something to fill her. She was looking for satisfaction in something other than the Lord Jesus Christ. It wasn't the fact that she'd gone from one man to another to another. That was the main sin. It, she would have sinned anyway. The point is, is that she was going from one man to another to another to another because it wasn't filling her. It wasn't meeting her need. What are you finding your satisfaction in? What are you looking for? Where are you looking? Because you will be experiencing the same dissatisfaction. Her life was like stagnant water, filthy, polluted, tainted. She was disgusting before God, as it were. And Jesus, what is he doing? He offers himself as the one who could provide cleansing. He could completely renew her. He doesn't cast her away. He says, yes, you're filthy, but I can cleanse you. I can take you and I can cleanse you. He offers him herself and he can offer, he, do, he offers you himself too. And Christians can fall into this trap when they sin, they feel dirty, and, and rightly so. But never forget what Lord Jesus Christ has done, because it's already cleansed you. Never forget it. Cling to it. But again, she doesn't get it. She doesn't yet get it. So he goes straight to the root of the issue. He goes straight to her moral conscience. And he exposes her sin in the most abrupt but gentle way. He didn't go straight there, but now he's going there. He's done, he's offered her this eternal life. She hasn't got it. She's gone off on a tangent. And Jesus is coming back now and he's saying, you need the scales to drop. Mm -hmm. And this is the way to it. He goes straight to the moral conscience. Isaiah said in, in chapter 6, Woe is me, for I am undone. Peter said, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man. The very presence of Jesus, the very presence of holiness exposes us. And Jesus, right now, is exposing her rebellion toward God in this passage. She's broken his law. She'd gone her own way. It's not, the, it's, not, it's, not, it's not the detail of the sin. It's the fact that she was in rebellion against God. But again, he does it abruptly, but gently. Jesus is gentle. There's only two of them. He doesn't make this public. He doesn't go around and start telling everybody about her sin. He doesn't announce it from the, from the rooftops. This is a private conversation between this woman and Jesus, and he exposes her sin between the two of them. They're alone. He shows her that he knows her intimately. He knows the very depths of her moral depravity. They're alone. And he does this with us too. Has he done it with you? Have you experienced the piercing eye of the Lord in the very depth of your soul. 
Do you know what that feels like? The burning eyes of the Lord. Have you experienced the pricking of your conscience? The uncomfortable feeling that you cannot shake off. Have you experienced the presence of holiness that causes you to say, as Isaiah did, woe is me. For I am undone before the living God. Jesus just offered this woman living water. And now he reveals to her, he knows the very depths of her depravity. He knows the darkness of her heart. He knows the filthiness of her life. He knows the shame of her life, but he still offers her living water. He still offers her everlasting life. This is the God we serve. The merciful God, a loving God, the one who takes us in the very pit of despair. In the, we, 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 like pigs, we wallow in the dirt of our own sin. God, he lifts us out. He cleanses us. He offers us eternal life. He doesn't leave us to wallow there. But he could do, and he'd be perfectly just to do it. But he's merciful. What is he doing in this passage now? He's showing her who she is. She is trying to hide it. She's trying to run away. She's trying to ignore it. But Jesus doesn't let her. That's what we all do, isn't it? We run away. But Jesus doesn't let her. Why? Because there is a real need. And the need is a repentance. A repentance toward God. Jesus offered her living water. He offered her eternal life. And yet, without the necessity of repentance, we cannot receive it. We can't drink it. Until... We have gone through that difficult stage of repentance. When we come to Jesus, there is something that needs to be dealt with. It's our sin. He will not ignore it. He won't let us ignore it. But we must first acknowledge it. We must face it head on. But there is no salvation. There's no healing. There is no gift of God without it. We must approach it we must head uh, we must we must face it we can't run away from it and if you're running away from it this evening even if you're a christian and you you may have done this once before but you may have backslidden in some way or there may be something in your life that you're just trying to hide from the lord well don't be so don't be fooled the lord sees it and if that piercing eye is on you now do not run away from it stop Allow the Lord Jesus Christ to expose it in you. It will be painful. But it's necessary. Think of the athlete who, 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 who's, uh, his eye is on the prize of the gold medal. He has uh, trained his entire life for this one gold medal. He has been through pain after pain after pain after pain. Most people would say, I've had enough. I give up. This is too painful. But the athlete is driven by that gold medal, by that prize. It's the same. In order to get the gift of God, in order to receive the Lord Jesus Christ, in order to drink, you must go through the pain of repentance necessary and Jesus is gentle he will expose him but he's gentle do not run away when he exposes her sin what does he do he doesn't start dragging her down does he no he does the opposite he builds her up he says you're honest he commends her for her honesty she agrees with him you have well said you spoke truly, he said. He does not condemn her, but the brazen exposing of her life is enough. He doesn't dwell on it. This makes her uncomfortable. Her conscience is pricked. She has come to the well in the midday sun to avoid people because of her shame. 
And here's a man who knows the very depths of her sin. She's tried to run away from it. And yet she meets the very man who knows it. The darkness of her heart is exposed. She perceives now. What does she perceive? She is in the presence of someone in touch with God. One minute, she's just he's just the Jew. A strange Jew at that who comes and sits at the well. And now, he's a prophet. This woman, something's beginning to dawn on her. She's starting to think. She's starting to see something. She begins to question seriously who Jesus is. He's no longer just a Jew sitting at the well in the midday sun, some strange man. He's now something more. And her mind is questioning it. Previously, she dismissed it. Something powerful is going on, and she changes the subject. She's a bit uncomfortable right now. She changes the subject, but Jesus engages with her. He doesn't linger on the details of her sin. Many of us would expect Jesus to start prodding more on her sin. Come on, you've got to repent more. Come on. But he doesn't do it. And then she starts going off into some strange theological debate about uh, where, where we should uh, worship God. Is it uh, under, in Jerusalem? Is it in Mount Gerizim? She's just had a, her life exposed. She'd run away. She'd had her life exposed before this man she doesn't even know. And yet, now he knows everything about her. And what does she do? She starts having a theological debate. Jesus doesn't say, enough of the debate, let's go back to this. Remember our merciful and compassionate living God, our Jesus, he engages with her. He's gentle. He knows she's hurt. She's in pain. Her conscience is more than pricked. She's experienced the burning eyes of the Lord. And God is compassionate. He engages with her and he says, She's wrong. As a Samaritan, the Jews have it right. But the whole order is about to change. She tries to get away from the subject. Jesus goes with her, but then he knows what he's doing. He's bringing her back in a different way. And he starts talking about the hour. Well, in John's Gospel, whenever we read about the hour, whenever Jesus mentions the hour, anyone mentions the hour, it always refers to the hour of Jesus' death and resurrection. That is what it means. It is a reference to the hour where he takes the sin of the world away, where he takes away her sin. And he says the hour is now. He's brought it all the way back again. She's exposed. She's running away again. Jesus goes with her, but he brings her back. And he brings her back in a way which is so gentle that he tells her, you don't have to run away anymore. In other words, I'm here. And the fact that I'm here means it is a done deal. My face is toward the cross. It is impossible for me not to go through with this. It is impossible for me to turn away. It is impossible for me to run. Because I've chosen to do this, and that's why I'm here. And the clock cannot be turned back. I wouldn't let it. And I'm offering you this. I'm offering you eternal life. Believe in me. My hour is what pays for your sin, and the hour is now. I'm here. And I will completely remove your guilt and shame. My hour, the hour is now, will completely remove your guilt and your shame that you are running away. You no longer have to run away. You change the subject, but I will change your very existence. You will have eternal life. He doesn't say the hour is coming in that way when the Jews will worship the Father. No, he says when the true worshippers will worship the Father. It's not limited to the Jews in Jerusalem. He's completely shattered that. He's looking for heart worship, true worship. Away with process, tradition, formality. Away with dead religion. This is what he's saying doing away with it. I've done away with it. The time is coming and now is 
when the Father is looking for heart worship. That's what we're doing tonight. We could be somewhere else. We could be in a field somewhere. It's not about the building. It's about the heart. That's what the Father is looking for. And he extends his offer again to her in this way. He's saying, even you are welcome. A Samaritan who thinks we should be worshipping the Mount Jerusalem, who doesn't know the Father, who doesn't know me, who's rejected most of the Bible, the Old Testament. Even you are welcome. This is not really true in our own day. How many people don't even know the Bible? And Jesus offers it. He doesn't say, you need to go and get a theological degree. He says, you know nothing. You are welcome. You are welcome. It's a free offer, a free gift. But there is a condition. You must worship in spirit and in truth. You must be born again. The, very, the, the, the previous chapter with his uh, encounter with Nicodemus, it's the same thing. You must be born again. You must be made new. I can do it. When you know me, when you believe in me, this will be so. This will be a reality to you. This woman, uh, she was an adulterer. She was a, a habitual adulterer. She had a messy, sinful life. But Jesus doesn't come down hard on her. Yes, he's blunt at some point. He's so gentle. He doesn't come down hard on this woman. There's a reason why he tells us not to judge those in the world. We've all been there. He wanted her to know one thing. And he wanted her to know it from the very depths of her soul, the very depths of her heart. And he wanted her to know who he was. That was what he wanted. This woman is thinking, who are you? We're waiting for the Messiah, she says. Jesus says, you're waiting for me. I am the Messiah. I am the coming one. I offer you eternal life. I who speak to you am he. See that. The climax of this passage is not her sin. The climax of this passage is not that she went from man to man to man. It was not that she was filthy. The climax of this entire encounter is when Jesus says, I who speak to you am he. It's the revealing of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the climax. Our sin gets exposed and it's necessary. But the focal point is Jesus Christ. It's always Jesus Christ. We must do everything we can to not miss the Lord Jesus Christ. Even as Christians, we go on with so many other things and yet we don't look at Jesus. We must look at Jesus. We must come to a true and intimate knowledge of who he is. Because when we see Jesus for who he is, when we really know him, we receive him. We receive the gift of God. And it's continuous. It's a fountain in us, constant, bubbling up. We receive cleansing. We receive new life. We receive pardon and, uh, and justification, which just means it means a right relationship with God. Why would we not continue to look at Jesus? This is what he's offering us, himself. And this brings us to our third point, hopefully a bit shorter. The result of this new knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. She's at the well with this man. Who is this man? Some Jew. In the midday sun. I'm trying to escape everybody. Now all of a sudden, what is it? He's a prophet. Well, he knows something. He knows me. And now he's the Messiah. He's the one we've been waiting for. Now, what does she do with this? This woman has just been through a roller coaster of emotions and thoughts in this very short exchange. Many of you might be thinking back to your own conversion. This is what happens. Mm -hmm. 
She had been cut to the heart. Jesus did not linger on her sin. He does not linger on our sin. It's necessary that we go through that. But he reveals himself to her. He showed her her real need. And then he reveals himself as a solution. The tenderness of the Lord does not crush her. It excites her. It excites her. The light is beginning to dawn. The, uh, the, the scales are dropping off now. She's starting to see something. Her eyes are finally opened. And what is happening? What does she do? She leaves her water pot. What does that imply? She ran. There was something hasty about this. She, she runs to the village. And what does she say? Come, see a man who told me all things that I ever did. Could this be the Christ? This strange man who wanted water, who dared to speak to a Samaritan in the open, a Samaritan woman. Let alone a morally depraved Samaritan woman. This man with supernatural ability to know everything about her. She now sees as the saviour of the world, the Messiah, the living God. In that very moment, her burden was gone, released. The weight had gone. It was lifted. Recall the, uh, the image of uh, Pilgrim's Progress when Christian gets to the cross. What has happened? What happens when Pilgrim looks at the cross? The burden drops. He's no longer hunched over. He's no longer depressed. He's no longer under the burden of a burden, as it were, the burden of sin. And what did he do? He looked at the cross. What does this woman do? She sees Jesus and she believes. She drinks and the burden is gone. An excitement she had never known. A courage and a confidence that caused the townsfolk to take note and listen to her. They were the very people that outcast her. She was an outcast. She was shamed. She went to the well when no one else did to get away from them. And now what is happening? She tried once to avoid them, and yet now she runs to them. The very people that hated her, the very people that shunned her, the very people that caused her to feel the guilt and shame. She runs to them. She runs to the townsfolk, and she says, could this be the Christ? Could this be the Messiah? In other words, go and see for yourself. Make a judgment. There was such a change in this woman that caught the attention of the people who outcast her. It's easy to miss. Wow, it's there. In those few verses. What a change this woman has gone through. When someone receives the living water that Jesus gives, it really does spring up into everlasting life. It, it's evident. She had a new vitality. You have a new life in you. It's, it's, it's living, it's bubbling. It cannot be missed. And this woman has it. Immediately she ran. It's refreshing. It's evident. Who's it evident to? Not just to her, but to the people who knew she was a stagnant woman. She was a sinner. She was someone who avoided everybody. And now, She's running to them and she's telling them about the Messiah. It's evident. And many of you know this to be true because you've experienced it yourself. You've passed from death into life. You've been radically changed. When someone passes from death to life, it's radical. It can't be missed. And that's what's happening here. It's not something that you've done. It's not something that you engineered. You didn't attend the self-help program. You didn't attend the program to get you from one stage to another. No, the Lord God showed you himself. He showed you who you were. And he showed you himself in the Lord Jesus Christ. And you drank. That is what you did if you experienced this. But if you did experience that, what are you doing with it now? What are you doing with this knowledge? Do you have the desire and the drive to tell others about Jesus as this woman did? Her immediate response was to run back to the village, to those who hated her, and to tell them about 
the Lord Jesus Christ? Are you zealous? Do you have a, a, a heart burning in you? Are you zealous to tell other people about Jesus? Is your heart burning like the, 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 apostle, uh, the, the, um, the disciples on the road to Emmaus? Did not our heart burn within us? Does your heart burn within you? Because this is the undoing of that. And the result of it is she ran to tell other people. She ran, not because she was commanded to run and tell other people. It's because the living water inside her was bubbling up. She needed to tell someone. She needed to tell others. Now, if you've not experienced this, you can experience this. Just replace yourself with a Samaritan, replace a Samaritan woman with yourself. Put yourself in the story. There's no difference. What does Jesus say? Ask me for a drink. That's what he says. All you have to do is ask the Lord Jesus Christ from the very depths of your soul for a drink. And then you need to drink it. You need to believe. The living water is contagious to those who are seeking to worship the Father. That's what's going on here. Remember, he says, uh, the, the time is now. And the living water is contagious for those who are seeking. When they see it, they will be drawn to it. For all who the Father gives Jesus, what does it say? They will come to him because the Father is drawing them. They will come and they will drink. And this Samaritan woman was one of those people and so were the townsfolk. They will believe when they hear the truth. That is what will happen. The Samaritan's town folk said, now we believe, not because of what you said, for we ourselves have heard him and we know that this is indeed the Christ, the saviour of the world. They heard the message themselves from the very mouth of Jesus. He'd spoken to their hearts. The promise was theirs. That's how we know this is for us. He spoke to the woman. But who was saved? All of the towns. They received the promise. The living water. Now a knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. If it does nothing. It means nothing. These people. They had a knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ and it produced in them a, a vitality that they never had. It was bubbling up. It was real. A radical change had taken place. The ignorance had been removed. The ignorance of the Lord Jesus Christ had been removed. When we truly experience Jesus, the presence of holiness exposes us, it makes us uncomfortable, but at the same time, it draws us to him. We need that exposing, as this woman did. But he always draws us to himself. Without this, any so-called knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ is not real knowledge. There's no knowledge. It's not intimate. It's not real there's no power in the knowledge of Christ, if there's no change, if there's no, uh, if there's no bubbling up inside, as it were, then it's not real. And you are still in your ignorance of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, that doesn't mean to say that you have to be going around waving your hands all over the place, but is it real? Can you say that you know Jesus? Can you say that you have an intimacy with the Lord. That is what this heart knowledge is. Or have you not experienced this? Are you struggling to let Jesus in? Are there things in your life that are so shameful? They are so abhorrent that you try not to remember them. You don't want to remember them. You want to do everything you can to shut it out. And you most certainly do not want the Lord Jesus Christ to see it. Reality is you cannot shake it off. You cannot run away. You can do everything you can to block it out, but you have to face it. You have to face it. Because the only way you're, you're the only reason you're experiencing that is because the piercing eye of the Lord is looking at you. And the reason he's doing that is he's saying, hand it over. Give it to me. 
I will take it from you. Stop running away. The hour has come. Now, if that is you, stop running from the Lord Jesus Christ. He offers you freedom. The burden that you feel will be completely released, completely taken off. This woman will no longer run, uh, walk to the, to the well in the midday sun. There's a consequence. She can stand up with her head held high and say, my saviour is the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the Messiah, the saviour of the world. The burden is released. When you look at the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, you will receive a full pardon and you will experience that weight being gone, being removed. Where does it go to? It doesn't disappear. It gets transferred. It gets transferred to the Lord Jesus Christ. It is when we see him for who he is, when we believe him, when we drink, the drink that he gives us, the water that he gives us, ask of me. It's when we drink, it's when we believe. That's when we experience this releasing. And if you are a believer this evening, you will be able to testify to that. And you will no longer have that burden. But many believers, and you may be one of them, when you take your eye off the Lord Jesus Christ, you heap burdens back on. They're not really there. But for some reason, you think that you can put them back on. Jesus has taken it. Look to him. Don't take your eyes off of him. Don't walk around under the burden of a, under the weight of a burden that Jesus has already taken. You're not going to be condemned for that burden. Stop moping. Look at the cross. Look at Jesus. He took it. Christians have no right to keep walking around under the weight of a burden that is not actually there because Jesus has already taken it. We see this in all its glory, in all its glory in this woman as she experienced real forgiveness. With real forgiveness when she acknowledged her sin. Jesus said, you spoke truly. In that moment, he had pardoned her, he had forgiven her. He didn't carry on talking about her sin, did he? She had been real with him. He forgives her. She experienced that sparkling water, that life in her bubbling up into eternal life as soon as the scales were dropped. That was the result. She couldn't contain it anymore. It was so powerful. It was so real. She couldn't contain it. She, she went forward. This could be you. Stoop down, drink and live like this woman did, like the townsfolk did. And if you are a believer, stoop down and continue to drink because you already have the life in you. Don't try and put it out. Come to the fountain of living water. Jesus says, ask me for a drink. Then do it. If you have heard him this, morning, uh, this evening, don't put it off. Drink him. And if you are a believer this evening, continue to look at Jesus. He has already given you this bubbling life inside you. Experience it. Don't. Try to heap a burden on yourself. Now, with that, we will sing him.